Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so first of all, thanks for the introduction. And of course, thank you for everybody tuning in from all over. Uh, I'm glad to see we have some people from the Philippines all the way up from Sagada. Um, so thank you for, for taking the time this evening. Um, hopefully I won't take up too much of your time and you guys won't stay up too late uh, because of this. And for those who are waking up early, also equally thank you. I know how hard it is to wake up before 9 a.m. Um, so a big thank you. So yeah, I guess um, I was given free reign to ramble, so there might be a little bit of that, but I, I guess maybe I'll start from, I guess, a little bit of the journey of how I ended up as an environmental scientist and you know how that eventually translated into sort of working in the energy transition and working sort of in the clean tech and climate space um, that I am now. So, I mean, like as mentioned, I, really it all started from, you know, like a deep love and appreciation for the environment. I literally grew up watching uh, Captain Planet. So if anybody ever watched that as a kid, that was my inspiration. I always wanted to grow up since I was a kid. I was just wanted to grow up and become Captain Planet. That was the, that was the ideal. That was the vision. That was the mission. Um, and because of that, I always wanted to be a scientist too. You know, I had a deep, um, I had a deep love uh, for the sciences. And so I went that route. The first thing I actually did when I went through my undergraduate um, was marine ecology. So that was the initial specialization. You know, at my, my first research was still on climate change, um, but on its effects on like coastal ecosystems. So that's where I spent a lot of my early research days. But you know, as I progress and in coming into the environmental science sector, the ultimate goal really was to address climate change, right? That was the big bad problem of the world. And that's how I, that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted to solve. And so I entered the environmental sciences with that in mind. Um, coming out of uni, my first job was in um, an environmental consultancy space. So I mostly did impact assessments for projects. And uh, funnily enough, uh, in a twist of fate, my first project that I worked on was the environmental impact assessment of a coal plant. Um, as I went through that process, though, you know, coming in, coming out of college, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed, um, I thought that as an environmental scientist going through this process, you know, this was the proper legal process. You know, this this was the checks and balances of the systems. I would come in, I would do my research, I would show the impact of the coal plant, and hopefully uh, that would have translated into, you know, whether that's even just mitigation efforts to combat, you know, these adversarial effects or even just to prevent a plant from happening in the first place. Um, you know, maybe it would have led to that. Unfortunately, throughout that process, um, it became quite clear that the, of course, I won't drop names, but the then developer of the coal plant uh, had bribed the mayor uh, and a couple of other local constituents and my boss at the time. So they asked me in that process to change a lot of things in the report. You know, don't say this, say this instead. And of course, I was just like absolutely shocked. And then I resigned on the spot. So completely disillusioned, uh, that was the impetus that led me to start my own company. I was like, you know what? Uh, the system is broken. I'm going to go try and fix it as an entrepreneur, which also, again, was a little, uh, I wouldn't say misguided, but it was very looking back and knowing what I know now and maybe being in the system a lot longer. Uh, you know, the, the decision seems a little bit more questionable. Luckily, uh, throughout that process and, you know, deciding to really want to go into the energy transition and really dove, you know, head first into, into the sector, really coming in from sort of this environmental science climate background, it quickly became apparent that there was a need uh, to be a sort of systems integrator at a more macro level, especially at the energy space. So especially as the energy transition rolls along, right, technology is constantly, constantly evolving and getting better. But the good news is that a lot of the technology pieces are all there, right? We don't necessarily need to, I mean, of course, further efficiencies are going to be beneficial, but at the moment, um, technologies like, for example, solar and say energy efficient technologies like LED lighting and all these sorts of things, they're already at the point where there are pretty significant financial benefits to be had by just implementing them, right? And still, despite all of this, and despite looking at the sector and saying, hey, there's so much potential, especially in the Philippines, 
it didn't seem like there's a lot of uptake for these solutions. So um, I did some initial training with some solar companies. I uh, worked with some energy efficiency um, firms as well, mostly on a consultant basis. Uh, a lot of it is volunteer as well. And, you know, that kind of helped me pull together all the information I needed to kind of jump in as an entrepreneur and say, hey, you know, this is what might be a better solution for you given sort of the current regime. And, you know, that sort of led to uh, kickstarting the company. And it's been about six years since then. And throughout that whole process, it's just been one big learning experience, right? So the landscape of the energy transition now in 2023 is in a lot of ways similar and also very different from where it was in 2017. So bit of a ramble, but uh, that's how I ended up, um, you know, from being, uh, you know, this very ambitious, um, very optimistic environmental scientist uh, to an entrepreneur within the climate tech sector. You know, it really was sort of this underlying um, desire to really help and combat climate change. Around that same time, it's been um, it's been fun because, uh, of course, COVID was pretty terrible for the world. But one benefit personally was that everything moved to, uh, you know, sort of this digital space, you know, where we got to work remotely and we got to be a lot more um, capable of managing our own time. And there's a lot more flexibility involved. Uh, so for me, what that helped me do was to be able to balance a couple of different roles. And now, for example, I wear a couple of different hats. So um, as mentioned, I do also sit um, in a couple of NGOs. Uh, one of the ones I'm pretty proud of working with now is uh, WWF, so the Worldwide Fund for Nature. So everybody sees the Panda logo. Uh, you know, it's pretty, uh, pretty iconic. And what I've done in the Philippines since then um, was put together the, um, the countries for WWF at least uh, first program that really looks at the corporate side of things from a sustainability and ESG perspective. So now we're advising, um, you know, a lot of the biggest companies in the country uh, on their sustainability strategy. And again, we're kind of rooting this from a very science-based perspective. So again, within sort of that climate sector, it's been fun playing and, you know, wearing both hats, both as from an entrepreneurial perspective um, in the private sector where we work um, as was mentioned earlier with you know, mostly commercial and industrial entities and, you know, helping them transition from an energy perspective and then switching hats also to the, the more NGO perspective and still looking at it, not necessarily from a very specific energy perspective, but more from a climate and sustainability perspective, right? So taking a look at, you know, mitigation needs and uh, adaptation pressures as well and, you know, addressing it from that perspective. Uh, so it's been a fun ride, uh, essentially, you know, navigating, you know, both sides of this. And then as a result, we've also got to interact quite a lot with policymakers and with regulators. So uh, as mentioned, we have advised the Senate of the Philippines. We're currently working with some cities as well, you know, designing these roadmaps for them from an energy transition perspective. Uh, and it's always super interesting, especially in the Philippines, to address issues of climate because you always have, like I mentioned, really that double pressure of one, we need to mitigate, so we need to reduce our emissions, right? So we need to transition. But there's also that extra pressure of needing to adapt to climate change, right? So the Philippines is, I think, uh, based on the, la the last ranking, over the past 20 years, we are the third most vulnerable country in the world to the effects of climate change, mostly through... Um, you know, climate-induced uh, like weather events, uh, severe climate weather events like typhoons. The five strongest typhoons to ever make landfall in the history of the world have all been in the Philippines and all within the last 10 years. Uh, so, you know, very destructive events. So for a developing country, um, whether, you know, you're a city or whether you're a big company, one, there's that pressure now to decarbonize. And two, while you're decarbonizing, which also costs a lot of both time, money, and effort, you also need to adapt to these worsening effects of climate change. So there's also that climate justice uh, lens involved. And, um, you know, COP was mentioned earlier. We don't need to get into that. It's going to take another hour just to just to talk about, you know, maybe COP and what, what's happening over, or what just happened over at COP. Um, but yeah, the, going back to that point, it's very interesting being in the Philippines um, and having to look at, 
these projects from both sides of the coin. Um, may, like an interesting um, maybe project that we have to work with. Again, I can't give too much details, but we were working with an entity in the renewable energy sector. Um, and there was some pressure, for example, for them to uh, to decarbonize, right? Because they had some, you know, remnant emissions, uh, you know, within their within their supply chain. And one of the big questions we were asked was for a renewable energy company that's already, for example, contributing to to you know the energy transition. Why is there still that need to mitigate? you know, stray or fugitive emissions as opposed to, for example, say other sectors. So looking at it from a climate justice lens, technically, yes, you know, every sector does need to mitigate. But in the Philippines, when there's still so many other, you know, low-hanging fruits or so many other sectors that we need to decarbonize, why are we looking at the renewable energy sector and, and pushing them to decarbonize? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's always super, uh, super interesting, again, especially now that we're also looking more regionally so we're looking at also some projects uh elsewhere you know in the region uh for example like say in in singapore uh you know indonesia and and malaysia how we're looking at the energy transition not necessarily just from a, na a very local perspective or a national perspective but a regional perspective right so looking at it you know from an asean perspective um whether that's you know looking at a regional grid or whether that's looking at uh, potentially uh, renewable energy fuels, um, so potentially you know green hydrogen, and that's in itself is a debatable topic. Uh, green hydrogen or ammonia as a potential way to decarbonize hard to abate sectors or regions, such as for example Singapore, right? Um, so there's a lot of interesting things happening again, and it's it's always such a fun sector to be uh, if if you really love like learning. It, it there's oh there's every day every single day there's something new to learn and there's something new there's a new problem to tackle um yeah so again sorry again bit of a ramble uh but suffice to say that's this where we are now and it's, it's a really just fun space to be in and i'm just super happy that i'm that i'm out here living my dream trying to uh and making progress towards uh pushing the agenda pushing the energy transition and fighting climate change Thank you. Thank you, John, so much. That ramble had a lot of multi lot of details, which I'm sure people might have picked on and want to go deeper into. I have some, definitely. But before that, I think um, uh, Anja and Shab has a question. Anja, would, can I just request you to come on audio and share your question with John? Since you have to... Hi, yeah. everybody. Um, nice to meet you. Thanks for your ramble, John. <laughs> I'm Anja. I'm based in Switzerland. Um, I've I've been uh, wondering whether you experience companies or people generally to be more ready for the transition and to decarbonize, so to speak, or do you face a lot of opposition? Um, I've lately I'm I'm new to this whole sort of journey myself. I read a lot, but I have read, for example, with certain technologies that the more developing countries have almost skipped you know, parts of the development. And for example, they might have skipped landline telephones and have gone straight to mobile phones. So I've been wondering whether as a developing country, it's possible to skip more of the dirty technology and go straight to the cleaner energy, um, whether people are more ready for this, and especially with experiencing the impact in that way. Yeah, no, that's a real okay. That's a really good question. Um, in terms of is it possible to skip some of these dirty technologies? So, in a lot of cases in the Philippines, uh, I'd say maybe in the vast majority of cases, unfortunately, the technology is already in place, right? So, there's a lot of um what we call carbon lock-in. So, there's a lot of momentum already from high carbon technologies or infrastructure that are already in place. Primarily being the uh. What was you know the what America standardized as the energy system where you have you know a central grid and you have these big power plants and you know have these massive transmission lines that route power from these massive power plants across the country. If you think about it in the in America back then, you know of course it made sense. In the Philippines in the modern day, with we were an archipelago of seven thousand islands, it doesn't make too much sense, right? And so we have. For example, in the Philippines, we have a lot of areas that don't have access to the grid. 
Um, we don't even, we've had trouble even connecting the, the, so there are three major regions in the Philippines, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And for the longest time, we've been trying to connect all the, the grids into one national grid. And we've had trouble even doing that again, because of issues of, you know, just the uh, quirks of the, the geology of, of the fact that we're several thousand islands. So in a lot of ways, the legacy infrastructure is very hard to disrupt from a momentum perspective, right? Um, you know, luckily with the advent of solar and being able to distribute energy and distribute power and distribute this generation across multiple sites, there's some ways to bypass that, um, which is what we're working on now as well. Um, but uh, in the one example I can potentially give, uh, hopefully we'll see about being able to bypass certain technologies is with natural gas or fossil gas, as I think it's more accurate to say it as a fossil fuel. Um, for example, in say the EU and in America and a lot of places, you have a lot of these, you have a lot of infrastructure for natural gas that goes all the way down to the residential sector. You know, you can pipe uh, fossil gas into homes for heating, um, in some cases for power as well. Um, in the Philippines, we did have a fossil gas deposit uh, out in the ocean in Malam what they call Malambaya. So we have been extracting fossil gas, but we've mostly been extracting it from the ocean and then basically just um, transporting that to our natural gas power plants. So that's mostly what it's been used for, just power plants. We haven't built that legacy infrastructure of piping it into homes or into industry or any of that. So potentially that's one way to bypass, you know, that what would lock in that infrastructure and that technology for, for decades. You know, there's no need to do that now that we have access to cheaper and distributed forms of energy that, you know, can do the same job at, you know, a fraction of the cost and at much higher efficiency. Um, unfortunately, there are still plans uh, currently in the Philippine Energy Plan to um, accept more natural gas imports. So now moving from a local supply of, of natural fossil gas to importing because our, our only supply of uh, fossil gas in Malampaya is set to run out in 2025 or 2026. So now we're looking at importing. And aside from importing, there are currently plants in place, although you know still hasn't moved at the moment, to build that infrastructure, you know, to find other uses for fossil gas and maybe use it to heat homes or we don't even need heating, it's a tropical country, or maybe using it for, you know, industry and all sorts of things. So there is that opportunity currently to bypass. Um, and hopefully we do, because again, there are a lot of many other options available. Um, so yeah, I hope the, that helped to answer your question. Um, and then, so sorry, I just read out the what you typed out um and i can address that also um experiencing climate change uh and you know how that uh, you know how that affects sort of maybe public perception we see a lot of public support in the philippines right so we have very strong very uh vocal uh, environmental groups and climate groups and of course a lot of them um, are driven by some of the direct impacts. Again, very destructive typhoons, flooding. Um, now we also have issues with with drought and that does affect certain areas and the agricultural sector in particular. From a, polit from a political perspective, um, there isn't, we're not as vocal, despite again, sort of being like, you know, the third most vulnerable country in the world to the effects of climate change. We're not as vocal as we ought to be. I believe, um, for example, um, our president ended up not going to COP, uh, which would have been a pretty good opportunity to do so in this COP very specifically. Companies, on the other hand, have been rather slow, but are now starting to come around to taking climate change seriously, uh, mostly because, again, you know, sort of the adverse physical effects of climate change have a direct financial impact on assets, right? So flooding, typhoons directly impact uh, the value of their assets. So from a risk perspective, from an adaptation perspective, you know, they there there is that sort of resilience factor that has pushed them to take some climate action. From a mitigation perspective, it's also been really interesting because up until I'd say maybe last year, there was no actual movement on the ground from most of the private sector to decarbonize, right? But now there is um, enough 
international investor pressure and market and transition risks um, that a lot of these companies are now beginning to take it seriously and sort of undergoing this uh, this process from a from a sustainability perspective. You know, taking a look at their GHG inventories, mapping out how do we decarbonize, um, and all of that. So it's been slow going, but we've uh, made a lot of headway recently, and then hopefully that ends up translating more in sort of the the, the policy making and regulatory space because I think it's been a little underwhelming in that sector. Uh, thanks, thanks, John, and and John for that question. Uh, Shab, would you like to come on audio and share your question? And also, okay, you came on the, ca the camera. Hi. Yeah, no worries. Hey, John, thanks for that. Um, you mentioned hydrogen, green hydrogen specifically, and and Singapore sort of offhand. Uh, I'm based here in Singapore, and we hear about hydrogen all the time, um, especially from a lot of the fossil fuel capital that's heavily invested in Singapore and money from Singapore globally invested in fossil fuel. And they love hydrogen and they talk about it all the time. I'm really curious to see what your perspective on that is. And especially from the capital of, because climate capital is first of all, very small, but even within that small amount, a lot of it goes to hydrogen. Uh, so I'm yeah. curious what your thoughts are on that, especially in, a, in an energy mix. Yeah. Um, so I think hydrogen in general is a very contentious topic and for a pretty good reason for almost the exact reasons that you mentioned, right? Whenever the fossil fuel industry is, you know, super hyped about something that's typically a big red flag. Um, so the two biggest cases for that are probably going to be, um, you know, CCUS, so carbon capture uh, technologies, and then of course, hydrogen. In my view on it is mostly that uh, the energy transition is immensely big and complex, and we need a pretty wide suite of technologies. Of course, so we're going to lean very heavily on some technologies over others, like wind and solar, right? You know, energy storage, these are pretty safe and, you know, um, pretty guaranteed. And we, we were very well studied in terms of sort of the the effects and how that ties in. Some of the bigger questions are going to be, um, you know, how big a part does green hydrogen play in the energy transition? Um, and right now, I think we still don't have a good answer for how we decarbonize certain sectors. So this is going to be mostly in the industrial sector, I believe. Um, industrial sector and then potentially some other smaller sectors like, say, you know, shipping. Uh, maybe aviation, but even then, sort of the numbers don't really make too much sense for aviation. Um, but mostly for industry, I think you know green hydrogen is going to play a pretty big role uh, in helping to decarbonize some of these sectors. That being said, um, we also need to allocate resources properly, and we need to make sure that transitions um, happen and aren't just fluff or a cover up for for something else. So in a lot of cases. Uh, when we, when a company or, you know, potentially when the fossil fuel industry pushes for hydrogen, we have to be a little bit wary, right? Because green hydrogen is incredibly inefficient. Uh, if you look at it from literally just how that process is, right? It's, it's wildly, wildly inefficient. Um, so again, we should be trying to use it as little as possible and for the hardest to decarbonize sectors that we can't really figure out any other way to decarbonize. You know, there's a lot of push for using green hydrogen, you know, in use cases for, say, power, and which I think just this is just absolute nonsense. And for maybe some other sectors, um, I still would not discount it completely, but I would put a lot of scrutiny into a large number of efforts or a large number of investments that are currently being put into it. Singapore is also sort of an interesting case, right? Because uh, again, it's it's small, doesn't have a lot of uh, you know natural resources with in terms of like say land space. I still think it's underutilized, but uh, it it would be an interesting case for potentially green hydrogen but again certain sectors and not to the extent that i think it's being pushed or not to the hype that's currently generated around it wouldn't you need a lot of space to make green hydrogen anyway because you would need wind and solar to power the green hydrogen yeah so not in singapore but this is where you look at it from a regional perspective right where you're looking at potentially indonesia um with with a lot more land uh that 
could It'd have be you know so sort of the cheaper systems. and more effective to just run a line from Batam or Bintang or somewhere in Peninsula Malaysia to Singapore and just have more wind and solar. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you know, sort of balancing you know demand and all of that. I mean, they were really trying to run a, a cable from Australia to Singapore at some point, right? Oh, Which I oh think don't get me started thing. on the Sun cable. It drives me nuts. <laughs> no, we we don't need to go there. Um, but yeah, no, sort of having a regional grid. You know, playing around with the energy mix. So uh, you know, being a little more proactive on say. Can I just pick uh, on the one area that you said that it might be useful? You said the hard to abate areas, so maybe specifically in steel or or somewhere else. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's where you're going, but is there anywhere that hydrogen in whatever form, green or otherwise, would actually make more sense than any other solution? Um. Yeah, potentially steel, right? Um. Cement, potentially. Uh, you might be able to look at ammonia. I get well. That's a, that's another, that's another whole other mess it's when okay. you talk about think... shipping. But I mean, there's not a lot of, especially when it comes to sort of like you know these really, the you know these industrial processes. I think, I, it. I'm mean, even green hydrogen might not even be the answer, but it's. I wouldn't discount it completely at this stage. Let, let's let's keep it at that right. for now. Thank you. Thank you, Shab, for that question. And uh, I think it will be great if everyone can switch on their cameras and videos if possible. Uh, and Shrishti has a very interesting question, John. Uh, actually, a fun one. Shrishti, would you like to come on audio and just voice it out? And also, we would like to see you. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Uh, hi, John. Hi, Saloli. Uh, so my question was that, John, you mentioned in the starting of the uh, uh, the meeting that uh, you were working in the consulting firm and uh, there you come, came to know after a while that there was some sort of bribery happening, uh, bribery happening from the uh, from the private sectors towards your and your uh, boss and so since that had happened in the previous consultancy that you're working for, did you face the same thing when you started own your own NGO, your own uh, entrepreneurship? And how did you tackle that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, unfortunately, in the Philippines, especially mm -hmm. if you're in the private sector, um, you're going to run across that at some point in your life, right? Um, mm -hmm. And yes, no, personally, uh, we have been offered, uh, sorry, we haven't necessarily been offered bribes, but we've been asked to bribe oh. people. Okay. Um, so, for example, when we were bidding for a project, right? Mm -hmm. And we were going through the bidding process uh, and we were trying to put out as competitive a bid as possible. Um, there were instances where, you know, people were asking us, yeah, you know, we'll get people in that, like, along that decision ladder were asking us, you know, yeah, you know, we'll give you this project if, you know, wink, wink, hint, hint. Mm -hmm. um, and so that had happened a couple of times. So uh, the only way to approach that is to, well, not, right? So by trying to stand on the strength of your proposal, like, you know, at some point, and in many cases, we had by far the best proposal um, from, you know, not just a price perspective, but I think um, from the the value that we're adding to the proposal and then you know that's still in a lot of cases isn't enough right and that's just how the game is played here um so definitely makes it a little bit harder especially as a startup in the philippines where there's you know not too much sort support in general for the startup um space and then on top of that you have to compete with you know people who are uh, bribing their way towards projects um but yeah i mean i think it kind of defeats the point if you know that's so there's no accountability it. or uh, uh, structure, um, uh, an institution that overlooks overlooks that prospect, right? Like you cannot reach out to someone and... <laughs> no. Okay, because the question was really relevant to us also because um, um, I'm from India and over here the, the concept of bribery is very prevalent. And I yeah. often wonder that if I have to start something someday, somewhere someday, how will I uh, continue it with uh, so much of corruption and bribery ongoing? So that I really wanted to ask you, how, how is it working in other countries? 
no it's it's absolutely the same here um so unfortunately and i i wager that almost anywhere in the world you're going to come across it but in the developing world in general that there, there has to be a lot more um corruption there's not a lot of transparency in a lot of cases as well so yeah i mean i'd still despite that you know there are ways to succeed and again if you're you're putting out a good product and you're putting out good work and what you're doing is valuable enough um you will meet with success so uh, if, if it's something you're interested in i'd say go for it um and just stay strong <laughs> really that's a that, that's all it takes it's it sucks sometimes it's gonna suck a lot of times um but you know there's there's a lot of value to be had in it thank you thank you for your answer Thank you. And I'm actually, uh, so I'm also from India. So I really resonated with you, Srishti, when you said it's exactly the same here. And actually, India, I think, is famous for the bribery and the corruption, which I'm sure is the same in Philippines. But uh, any other questions anyone has or any comments? I see, uh, Sharad, you mentioning your perspectives from the COP. Uh, yeah. Yeah, those are some interesting perspectives, um, especially with the optics. Uh, that's an interesting one, right? So kind of speaks um what I mentioned earlier about, you know, sort of the fluff and the potential facade that there might be with some of these green hydrogen announcement projects. You know, again, yeah, there's so much, uh, you know, of all the expected capacity to be developed, again, only a fraction really have like hard off take agreements, uh, which says a lot about the sector, right? Yeah. Shall I do you have yeah, no, definitely. And, and I guess... You know, there were a bunch of bankers there, right? Where a lot of these big projects are struggling in an era of high interest rates. And yeah. people ask them, look, what will it take to fund all this, right? And and I think their worries are around, uh, you know, like just supply and, and also demand, right? So like the market is still not completely formed for some of these things. And then the huge amount of uh, execution risk that there is there. So yeah. uh, it's not an easy journey in this environment to get projects across the line. Like that was the overarching sentiment. I mean, I think people also spoke about like we need standards for transportation of hydrogen. Uh, we need certification for what is really green. I think people get lost a lot in the colors of, you know, uh, yep. gray, blue, green. I think there is a pink as well now. Yep. And uh, in some ways, like there was kind of this allegation that what the fossil fuel industry really wants is, you know, uh, blue hydrogen, where they keep getting yep. the chance to sell gas yep. and uh, their product has a market. But look, I mean, I don't think we can discard anything and put it off the table. Uh, yep. Clearly, we need a whole mix at this point. So uh, at least that's the sense I got. Yeah, no, I'm definitely with you there. I still think we shouldn't completely, again, I mentioned, I don't think we should discount green hydrogen. I think, yes, certain sectors, um, steel, cement particularly, um, maybe even chemical sectors for certain areas. Um, green hydrogen could potentially play a role. And again, you're combining that with a lot, massive build out of wind and solar. Um, and you're looking at, you know, balancing potentially regional grids. Um but I, yeah, I said the market is so far from, I think, being solved or even ready. Uh, and there does need to be a lot of scrutiny. Again, sort of generally, this is this, again, red flag for the fossil fuel industry. Um, when they're heavily invested in something and to this extent, and when you look at it as what potentially could it play? a role in for continuing business as usual for their, their current operations. John, can I ask you a question about geothermal, if that's okay with your Ooh, and, and Salome's permission? Yep. So how do you see geothermal in your part of the world with, uh, like, you know, clearly there is the intersection of the tectonic plates where the geothermal gradient in the earth is much nicer, right? Places like Iceland, for example, have... Yeah really taken off in terms of using geothermal uh, any any perspectives from what you are seeing yeah no absolutely that's a great question um so the philippines used to be the have the second highest geothermal capacity in the world um but we haven't built any we haven't had developed any new geothermal capacity i think in the past two decades so we slowly dropped uh 
I think geothermal is really underlooked in the Philippines. And, you know, there's some reasons for that. But we've seen pretty massive upticks in geothermal development in Kenya, for example. Um, Indonesia as well has also been scaling up some of their geothermal sectors. And then in sort of the Scandinavian areas, in the Scandinavian region, we've seen geothermal in some interesting ways, not necessarily just as power, but potentially also for heating, right? So I think geothermal uh, should play a larger role in the Philippines' energy transition than it currently does. You know, if there's a lot of room to grow, there is massive geothermal potential that we really haven't um, that we really haven't looked at. Uh, that being said, there are some difficulties involved, right? So we've now. Uh, when it comes to geothermal, specifically in the Philippines, the a lot of the sites usually occur near high biodiversity areas or like key conservation areas might be protected landscapes. So, you know, there's that problem of, you know, we need to transition. Yes, but at what cost? And it often in the cases should not come at the necessary the cost of our these protected landscapes. So there are environmental considerations. Uh, there are exploration issues as well these typically tend to be uh costly and for example in the case of kenya um these were heavily subsidized right by the government the exploration um and that led to i you know a lot of investment in the sector um because of that in the philippines there's nothing really from that end as well so um, a lot of these private companies, um, someone mentioned EDC, you know, might not be willing to take on that risk and, you know, those long time and involved of exploration and then development and then construction. Uh, but I think it's a very underlooked at sector and um, hopefully, uh, you know, and hopefully maybe through the work that we'll do as well, we want to publish uh, some reports on it next year. Um, we can you know, convince, uh, you know, our Department of Energy or some of the regulators and policymakers to push for the industry more. Because again, it's a, it's, it's a bit of a waste. We, um, we have a lot of potential. We have some, a lot of the capacity, we have a lot of the technical capacity here through the existing geothermal plants. Um, so, you know, here's hoping that it plays a larger role in the energy transition for the Philippines moving forward. Thank Thanks you so much, John. Any other questions? Seems like not, but John, I have one for you. Uh, sure. Specifically. So, you know, I think in the comments also, the questions that came up, it's and even in your own sharing, it's easy to see how many gaps there are, especially when you are an entrepreneur and especially when you are at a position when you're trying to integrate systems. That's what you essentially said, right? The kind of work and the kind of transition we are hoping for can't happen without that integration. But there are a lot of these gaps and challenges are always there to sort of bring us down, right? And there is this one, of course, common motivator amongst all of us, especially entrepreneurs like you that keeps us going in. Is that a passion for making this transition happen? Because we really do not have an option. But like as Shrishti asked, and I, I personally have that question as well, and I'm sure some other people might have here. Were there some other uh, experiences that you had that made it worth to do that transition for you from say a scientist to an, an entrepreneur other than this passion of ours what keeps you going on is there any other experience any other advice that you got any other support that you got you know so what is it that perhaps aspiring entrepreneurs can take away from the session as well to say okay you know not everything is bad or just pulls us down there are some things that also push us upwards other than our passion of course yeah so um yeah, so definitely passion, I think, plays a big part in it, right? So, you know, that's sort of really the big North Star. Um, and that always kind of helps guide sort of a lot of the decision making. Um, if, you know, if I decide to take on something, whether it's a new risk, uh, such as starting a company or maybe working in the NGO sector or maybe doing this venture or that, um, I really look at sort of that North Star of, will this help me help address climate change, right? Um or, you know, just climate uh, issues within climate as a whole. Uh, so that's really the, the big North Star. But I mean, aside from that, there's a lot that happens in between, you know, that decision and that North Star, right? Um, so, you know, it's, I, I would, I wouldn't recommend anybody to rely on passion alone, um, because that tends to 
common waves, I'd say, right? It's impossible to try and stay just purely passionate and optimistic the entire time. Uh, a lot of that has to be grounded in, you know, discipline um, and uh, being grounded in um, being grounded in general, being realistic. Um, so I think that's a really key part of it where building discipline and building uh, sort of that plan where you know that no matter what happens, you know, you're going to be doing this, you're going to be doing this work, you're going to be trying to learn on the days where, you know, you can't really rely on your passion so much, or for example, on those hard days where you encounter uh, <laughs> some of the, the terrible things that happen in the world, whether that's bribery, whether that's corruption, um, or in the Philippines, my gosh, we are the, uh, we have, I think right now we're the most dangerous country in the world for environmental activists. We have a lot of um, we have a lot of killings actually for environmental activists, you know, so there's a lot of dark days. There's always going to be a lot of dark days, but being able to fall back on, you know, discipline and having that plan kind of helps you always keep on track. Um, that being said, it's not always doom and gloom, right? There's going to be a ton of wins. There's going to be a ton of wins uh, and it's super important to celebrate even the tiniest of them. Right. Um, having a single person uh you know being able to change the mind of a single person not necessarily even a company could be a friend it could be a relative it could be um someone you met in a conference being able to influence them in, in what seems like a positive way um it's a win and you know those should be celebrated so i think the two things for the two the biggest points of advice I would have is, well, always try to fall back on discipline um, because passion and motivation will tend to fade and flicker and celebrate as many of the small wins as you possibly can because we tend to forget those. I think someone is raising their hand too if they want to maybe add to that or if they want to um, Nick, you your hand. Did you want to add anything or ask any question? Yeah. I thought I had lowered my hand before you noticed, but never mind. Um, <laughs> yeah, just a well, quick thank you, John. i um, been really interested listening to you. I've, I work for an environmental solutions company, a uh, Singaporean company, but I, I'm based in Vietnam, um, and certainly resonate with a lot of the things that you've been talking about. Um, it's certainly um, the, the, the corruption and bribery is something that impacts us all in this part of the world. Um, oh, yeah. But, you know, just echoing kind of what you were talking about there, um, why do we keep doing it? I think it's also important to realize something like COP is, is well, it's a bit of a cop out, actually. Um, people <laughs> kind of come to these events thinking that they're going to solve world peace and everything else. But there have been very few of these COP events that have made huge differences. Um, and, you know, all of the, the, the on and on about fossil fuels. The, the climate industry and the, the, the sphere that we're all in um, is huge. I was talking to a, a guy here today um, who was similar to you, looking for, for somewhere to, to jump off from working in banking and finance in London. Um, he's been out here, in, well, I'm actually in Dubai at the moment, but um, he's been out here for six months just seeing what's going on um, and trying to find his area that he wants to get into. Um, and, you know, in terms of day to day, you know, there are so many options. And when we talk about, I, I always say, I work for an environmental solutions company and there are a lot of environmental problems. So don't be disheartened when something doesn't seem like it's going right. Just keep kind of plugging away, look at those small wins. Um, and eventually they, those kind of build up to something that you can be proud of. So um, yeah, to everyone here, keep going. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for that, Nick. That's a that's a great insight. There's a great quote I actually heard recently about about COP. If anybody's been you know sort of disheartened by by COP, um, that COP is the scoreboard. It's not the game, right? So the game is everything that happens in in the entire year. Uh, and while COP in itself is you know this giant, messy, inherently and intensely complex uh, melting pot of the entire world and all the various sectors in it to address the biggest problem the world has ever faced. Uh, it tends to be always rather disappointing, but you know it's not just 
about cop or what happens at cop it's really everything that happens in between and then hopefully you know we we make progress from there i just just to add to that as well i think i mean i, I worked in tourism for nearly six years and i went to a lot of travel shows in, in berlin and london and you know 40 50 000 people coming through in a weekend and you stand at a booth all afternoon and you know you might see a few people and it is demoralizing but it's not where any of the business gets done the yeah. business is done when you're having a coffee or you're having a beer at the end of the day and you meet people and that's where you actually get stuff done so when you look at the 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 the, the coverage of cop and it's just world leaders sitting on the stage that's not where anything gets done. That's not oh, where yeah. the real work gets done. That's, you know, down in the back corridors where someone from Tanzania who's got an amazing project finds this, you know, a, a, a small uh, climate fund supplier who really wants to get into this a sector. And, and that's where the stuff gets done. So um, take take a lot of what happens at, at COP with a bit of a pinch of salt and, and don't be demoralized because there's a lot of places out there, a lot of organizations that are looking to fund your projects. So, yeah. That's actually super great advice, um, and not just for COP, but for generally conferences, I think. Um, like Speaking from experience, one of the early catalysts um, for, I think, starting the entrepreneurial journey was um, before I started the company and attended one of the biggest energy conferences uh, in the Philippines at the time. And I think on the last day, um, I met uh, one of our now technology partners, um from slovenia and we got beers afterwards and you know that's sort of where a lot of again sort of the a lot of where the magic happens right a lot of where these these important connections and you don't even at a time know them to be these important connections it's typically going to be outside the booths um so uh if anybody has a chance to attend cop i would recommend that just because that's all the best minds when it comes to clean climate tech Everybody congregates there and, um, yeah, maybe ignore the big wigs <laughs> talking and uh, go down and, and, and meet the people on the ground working on some of the coolest stuff you could possibly imagine. We just we had a, a, a project, um, a pitching project with the CFA, the Climate Finance Accelerator. Yeah. Um, so we were part of that in May this year in Hanoi. And uh, the minimum ticket was five million dollars. Um, so we went in with five million. We we're doing a anaerobic digestion for uh, rice straw. Um, certainly, you know, producing biogas and, and fertilizer for the farmers, which is great. Um, and certainly in, in our part of the world, something that's uh, pretty important. Oh, yeah. you know, um, Vietnam's the second largest exporter of rice in the world. So there's a lot of rice straw and a lot of it being burned. Um, but a lot of the investors that were there were hsbc standard charter the big boys and they was they were telling us flat out like we love what you're doing but um you know we're not going to get out of bed and we're not going to start sending emails for less than 20 million dollars you know mm -hmm. um but on the back of that thinking that we kind of you know <laughs> overdone it a little bit we've now met with four different people who are interested to to invest the right kind of money so you know getting yourself out there Get, you know, speaking to people like the, the ADB, speaking to the CFA, yeah. get involved with these programs because um, you learn a lot. You know, it's all well and good having a, a great piece of technology and a, a great solution that looks great and it looks good on a Jesse report and everything else. But if you don't know how to put together a pitch and how it's going to work financially and you want someone to give you $5 million, but you've got no idea of what the ROI is and when these people are going to get their $5 million back, then they're just going to, ignore you you know so there's a lot of preparation that takes place and there's a lot of resources out there that can help absolutely i'm 100 with you um especially for those of us in the you know the clean tech sector communication i think is one of the most important skills you can you can focus on and, and work on developing um especially again in the sector where change is critical right like where that's the entire impetus of of everybody here in the sector we need to get people to change we need to get these institutions to change and if you can't communicate well it's going to be very hard to do that so yeah i guess it's a little pro tip um communication super super key thank you nick so much and thanks john uh i think we'll we are going towards a closure but i loved uh how we ended also because you know i am a terra uh lfa alum 
And there was this one thing when we, because this was the exactly mood that everyone comes in, right? That it's all doom and glory and nothing <laughs> is going to happen. And, you know, every, every, even the scientists, everyone had this uh, sort of a deep uh, negative pessimism inside them, right? About what, what will we do? Because at the end of the day, policymakers are not taking see, taking it seriously and so on and on and on. And I think one of the biggest advice that we in the end got is that you just do your own stuff and just be confident that there are lakhs and hundreds, you know, thousands and I don't know how many people out there doing it. And I think just get a beer with them somehow or maybe hop onto an open door climate. And there are so many support networks now that you can just hop on and just meet someone who's doing great work like everyone here, I hope. But uh, as we close, I'm going to um, share a poll with every one of you. It would be great if we can get a quick quick feedback. And because we have a few minutes left, John, I'm very curious and I'm sure others are as well. What are your plans now moving forward? What is it that you're working on currently? Is there anything uh, interesting and exciting that you would like to share with the group? Yeah. Um... So there's actually a couple of big things that we're that we're doing um in 2024. Um so I think one of the bigger ones is uh so you know my company, uh Vern Energy Solutions, we're making a little bit of a shift from looking at it from a purely energy perspective to a wider climate perspective. So we're gonna be now Vern Climate Solutions uh this 2024. The focus is still going to be uh, on the energy transition, but we're going to take a little bit of a wider climate lens and framework to take a, uh, as an approach to some of these problems. Um, we're also going to be putting up a new product. Um, uh, we're currently a little bit in stealth mode at the moment, but we're hopefully going to do a bigger launch uh, in January. So I'm pretty excited about that. So um, that's going to be fun also, again, sort of in the energy space. Um, and then, you know, a bunch of other things as well, like, like, uh, what, what you mentioned when you, um, when you kick this off, you can typically find me in my garden. I love plants. Um, so we have a couple of cool plant things that are coming up. One of the, one of the things I've been super excited about has been working on, um, Philippine forests and Philippine plants. So, um, we just discovered this cool new species of like this carnivorous pitcher plant that lives way up on this limestone cliff in Palawan. We're going to be publishing that paper soon. Uh, and then hopefully we're going to be making like a little bit of a short film or documentary on it. So I'm super excited about that. You know, anything about plants, I'm always pretty happy to do. Uh, and we also launched this mini collective called Plant Vision, um, where we hope to help um, bring some awareness to how plants affect um, our lives, culture, um, through a mix of art, design, and some some lectures here and there. So I'm always super, super happy to talk about plants. And, um, you know, all the energy stuff aside, that's also something I'm happy to plug. And another Terra session to be organized for. Oh, happy to do that. I can, I can ramble for another hour just on plants. <laughs> yeah, that's Kirti to decide. But I would love oh. to be part of that session. And I'm sure others would like to connect with you, John. Is there any way they can connect to you? Just any um, email ID, LinkedIn connect, anything that you would like to just put in the chat so that others can. Yeah. So oh, LinkedIn is probably topic. the best way to connect with me. Um, so if you type in my name on LinkedIn, I feel like I might be the only one there or um, prop could be at least one of the, if you're, especially if you're in the energy sector, we probably have, um, you know, some mutual connections. So LinkedIn, uh, I will put the link uh, in the box now uh, in case just to make life a little bit easier for everybody, but happy to connect with everybody through there and if you want to have a further chat um about anything whether energy climate or plants you feel free to reach out perfect thank you john anyone else any last minute thoughts or uh, anything that you would like to say i think everyone took everything that you said john and i'm sure you will Hopefully. get connects Yes, thank you everyone for joining in uh, again from within the terror community or outside. But Shab, you just opened your video. Oh, no, I just wanted to say thank you as well. So. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Awesome. Bye bye. And thank you, John. Thank you so much for taking out this time and sharing your experiences with us. Yeah, thank Thanks, you so much, John. everyone. Super appreciate this. Have thank a great you. day, all. Bye bye.